Hello and welcome back to another Before You Buy and today I want to talk about backups and redundancy. It's a subject I think I talk about on this channel at least every five to six months because a lot of you are making your first tentative steps into the world of data storage and you don't quite know what the options are. You don't quite know whether your data storage setup is robust enough to withstand a failure and you're wondering what the key options are. And today I'm going to talk about five of the most important and the most relevant means of backup and redundancy that you guys should factor into your data storage array. I would recommend utilizing all five of these if you can, whether you've got the storage available or the budget. But as long as you've got at least three of these in your backup or redundancy strategy, I think you're going to be okay. But if you're a business user, try to aim for all five. Let's go for all five different means. The first one is, of course, NAS to NAS or NAS to server. What that means is that the data inside your network attached storage device be it in total or certain key elements that are most important are backed up somewhere else. And that is either on another NAS, on a completely separate building, network and internet connection, or on the same network. Now, predominantly users will use a system known as R-Sync or real-time remote replication synced in with it. That is the means of integrating these two NASs to communicate. And it doesn't have to be the same brand for one of them to send data to the other. Now, it can be done in multiple ways. It can be done with two-way or one-way synchronization, and there are lots of options built in. In fact, all the popular NAS brands at the moment have their own tool built in that allows R-Sync um, synchronization between two NASs via the network, although some of them have slight difficulties with remote synchronization on third-party servers using the internet. Now, R-Sync of all the systems that we're going to talk about today is by far the most expensive from the outer. It requires you to buy a whole other NAS server or third-party Linux server to build. Um, it also requires storage media inside, and you are going to want to at least have the same amount of capacity as your original storage device, or you're going to have to make preparations for the future, which means that you're going to have to have two to three times the storage, because occasionally you might end up with the data on the core system being deleted or changed, which means you need to make sure that the data on the R-Synced server, there's enough space to make up for those versions of change later on. But bear in mind, if you delete a file off the original NAS and it only exists on that r -Sync server, that r -Sync server is no longer a backup. It's the only place that data lives. So don't do that unless you have another tier of one of the other um, backup or redundancy options that we're going to talk about today. The other benefits are an R-Sync NAS to NAS or NAS to server backup can be scheduled. It can be set up once and then forgotten about. It can be done in the background and you only ever hear about it when it goes wrong or one NAS doesn't find the other on the network. It's again the most expensive upfront system of all but in recent years NAS brands have made it incredibly easy and straightforward and hand-holding to set up a NAS to NAS backup. And if you are upgrading to a new NAS, then this is a great way to take advantage of your old hardware to just live there low key in the attic or using a power link adapter, sending internet through your home. So have a power link. You can use any manner, any manner of power link adapter in your home to send a network connection via the mains power from one end of your house or business to the other, and then have a nice backup running long term. Now, that's the first one. The next method I recommend trying out is NAS to cloud. Now, different brands have done this a very different way, and Synology I'm talking about has done it the most unique way, but backing up your NAS to the cloud is probably one of the easiest. All the NAS brands at the moment have the means to integrate and synchronize data from your NAS with the cloud. So cloud services such as Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, stuff like that, all of them have got that feature built in to a lesser or greater degree. And you can either have it so that some content of your NAS is backing up constantly to that cloud space, or you have an area of cloud space and folders on the NAS that are synchronized with your NAS. Now, there are, of course, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, some of the core advantages, as mentioned, is it is very affordable. Now, cloud space, you can get hundreds, if, hundreds of gig, if not terabytes, for you know, single or even double digits of pounds and dollars every month. It's an incredibly small amount of money. Maybe you just won't go to the pub this week. Boom, good for you. You've just paid for a month or two of cloud storage by not doing that. Now, also on top of that with cloud synchronization, 
you haven't got to buy big servers or worry about it being in your home or your business. So in the event of, say, a fire and the NAS goes up in smoke, you don't have to worry because the backup was all the way there on the cloud. There are, of course, disadvantages, though. First and foremost, you are heavily reliant on your upload and download. You are going to be utilising your own internet connection to do this, and the size of your backup, at least the initial backup, you can get away with something called differential backups where it only backs up changes afterwards but at least the initial backup is going to be huge and if you are going to try to back up your main backup array regularly unless you schedule it at a kind of off-peak time it can affect other devices in the network environment if you don't have priority of service or quality of service controls whereby this backup might suddenly eat up the entire bandwidth of your home or net, uh, business network and other users are just sat there looking at the little um, was it sand counter turning up and down? Why couldn't I just say spyglass? Egg timer. That's the word I was looking for. Egg timer. But uh, on top of that, the other inherent disadvantage of utilising the cloud is it's very short term. Although it seems very, very cheap on day one, as every month you pay, you're paying for that cloud service. Eventually, you're either going to have to shut that account or buy hardware to put that back up onto. And if you aren't running a, a backup system where you've got multiple tiers, and that cloud has only got change files or has unique files, then eventually you're going to have to download it onto hardware. So either you're going to put it back onto the NAS or you're going to have to buy something later. So although it's very cheap in the short term, it can be very expensive in the long term. Even a five or a tenner a month. A tenner a month is 120 a year, which again, every year, 120 quid. You can buy a one bay NAS for that pretty easily for about 200 quid. So again, it's a very versatile and easy setup platform with all the NAS brands arriving with support of these third party clouds, but it is very short term and I think it factors into maybe a third tier of your backup strategy or you can utilize hybrid um, storage, which is something Synology and QNAP are getting very, very heavy into with uh, Synology in particular with their Synology C2 and hybrid share platform with their own third party, I'm um, sorry, their own first party cloud platform. The next backup option is one that certainly is one that is affordable to a number of us in the middle ground there that look at the cloud and go, well, it's really cheap, but not very long term. And buying another NAS is ridiculous. Go for a USB. A USB backup is by far the most affordable, long term and short term. And all the NAS brands support USB backups in a myriad of different ways, whether it's one touch copy buttons that I'm always talking about here on the channel or automated systems where you take a USB drive that you have on you regularly, like this is 2TB, this is pretty cheap actually, and then get a GTEC drive like this one, connect it directly into the NAS, and either manually action a backup of all or the most important data onto the USB, or an automated system where you connect it, and as soon as it recognizes that drive being connected to that USB port, it automatically actions the backup you need. Now, you don't have to always disconnect, reconnect, disconnect, reconnect. You can leave it connected at all times, and then periodically the system will back up to the USB drive as and when needed. USB NAS backups, incredibly straightforward. Again, not quite as easy as NAS to cloud, but definitely easier than NAS to NAS backups. They also allow um, a lot more room for growth. So you can have archival backups where once you filled up a drive, you can go, right, well, that was 2018. Stick it on the shelf, grab another one. You're good for 2019. And you can have that scaled area of storage with the added benefit that a lot of USB drives these days are incredibly robust, not only in terms of their external design like this one, but also in terms of uh, the hard drives inside. Laptop hard drives are better than they've ever been. And with SSDs being more affordable as well, there's a lot of options there for USB backups to keep it very, very affordable. What are the downsides? Well, it's another thing to lose. And if you are having USB drives, just because they're more robust than they've ever been doesn't make them infallible. And as a standalone, easy backup option, I think it's great as another tier in your backup strategy, but I wouldn't make it your main backup strategy because one, it requires a lot of human intervention often, even a scheduled backup. There's so many ways in which it could be disconnected. There's so many ways in which a parameter could be overwritten. It is very, very useful, but I'm not gonna say it's the safest of all. It's safest in terms of popping it in your pocket, your bag and taking it with you, but in the social sense of safety, in the actual material sense of safety rather than as a robust scheduled process, it's less safe, I believe, and it factors in one of those, but 
ultimately if you're looking at backups i would have all three of the systems in place because a nas to nas backup is one that you can make over time a nas to cloud backup you can even do for free uh with a hyper backup and hybrid backup sync 3 allowing you to connect both uh, connect a dropbox a google drive a OneDrive. Um, and more and more cloud services all connected each with their own free 2 20 50 gig of data space and then each one of them you just have the right data you can actually create a free nas to cloud backup strategy for the right amount of storage if you coordinate it right and nas to usb drives you don't even have to go this big you can go real small if you choose with everything as small as a tiny little usb flash disk if you choose i've got one here in my pocket that i'm desperately trying to reach you can go for some nice and simple. That's a 64 gig um, USB there, and that was a tenner. So it's not expensive to have a standard USB protocol there. So again, another way in which you can have a backup strategy there, loads of options available. But it's not just about backup. Let's talk about redundancy. Redundancy is something we talk about in NAS all of the time. What is redundancy? In its simplest form, it's a safety net. That's all it is. You are having a NAS, You've got your dealing with your data, and what you need is a safety net. Redundancy in NAS can often mean the PSU, where you've got a PSU in the background that's there to catch things, a failover. And in redundancy in data storage terms is generally associated with RAID. Redundant array of independent disks, or redundant array of inexpensive disks if you're super old like me. Now, um, redundancy means that when you are writing data to all the disks, if one of those drives dies, you don't want to lose all your data. So what happens is, depending on the RAID configuration you use, data is written across and a uh, either a copy of all the data lives on another disk or the, when the data is written, one drive will be given a blueprint. So in the case of, say, RAID 1, you have two disks, each one being read and written to simultaneously all the time. Consequently, both disks have exactly the same amount of data. So if one disk dies, you've still got all of the data intact. In the case of a RAID 5, for example, you would have multiple disks, but with every disk on there, it goes right data, right data, right data, right data, and on the last disk, depending on the number of drives you've got, it puts a little blueprint of the data it's put on all the others and pops it there. The next wave of data, right, 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 blueprint, right. And with each wave, every block of data that's written, the blueprint is moved to another disk. The result is, if one of those disks dies, the system can rebuild and access the data live, even in a de degraded state, across all of those disks, thanks to a combination of the data and the blueprint being present on every single wave. Now, factoring in your RAID is important because some RAID have higher read and writes than others. Some RAID allow multiple disks of failure, such as um, uh, RAID 6 and RAID 10. So making sure you've got the RAID, right RAID configuration is very, very important. It's not a backup, and that's why we're separating it from the RAID backup there. This is redundancy there. It's very, very important. So having the right re uh, redundancy is going to be very key to the size of your storage array and the importance. Just remember, RAID 1, super fast. RAID 0, super fast, not safe. RAID 5, pretty fast, quite safe. RAID 6, probably the slowest of the lot, but two disks of redundancy. And RAID 10, fast as hell half your drive's gone. You lose half, you lose 50% capacity. If you want to learn more about RAID, just look up what is NAS RAID or what is RAID for NAS. You'll find it on Google. I'll be there. I'll see you there. But the other area of uh, a combination, I think, of redundancy and backup together is something known as snapshots. Now, snapshots take a little bit of the logic of both and move it into this new category. Snapshots have been very, very vogue over the recent years because although snapshots have existed for a very long time, new file systems and more efficient CPUs have allowed snapshots to be greater in number, be available on lesser and more power efficient CPUs, and have lessened the impact on the system resources being consumed to create them. Time was several years ago that snapshots were incredibly desirable, but to run snapshots made your system slow down so much. Luckily, that is not the case anymore. Thanks to things like BTRFS, thanks to things like ZFS, and thanks to more um, efficient hardware and more efficient software, making snapshots have a lesser impact on the system. A snapshot Say your NAS storage, that's all your NAS storage inside the NAS. A snapshot, as the name suggests, takes a snapshot 
of the data. It doesn't take up as much space as a full backup, but it's effectively a blueprint. It's still pretty big, but it takes a blueprint of size of the overall data. As time wears on, you can say how often you want these snapshots to happen. And with each snapshot, the differences that happen in your storage are maintained. The result is that you can have your storage, uh, your data storage in your NAS, but in your snapshots, you have got the last few weeks of everything that's happened and every change, and it's in a timeline. So in the event of a problem, you can revert through your timeline and go, ah, that's what it was like before the event where it all went wrong, and you can revert your storage to that point. Also, snapshots don't have to be kept inside the NAS. You can make sure that even though the NAS is where your data is, the snapshots are being maintained on another NAS, on a USB, etc., etc. Now, as good as snapshots are, and they really are good, in both in terms of the amount of space they take up, is way less than that of a standard backup of all of your data, they do have their own inherent disadvantages. The first disadvantage is... If you start, if you run out of space for your um, snapshots, or you only have X number of versions to maintain space, and you start writing over the old one, that window there is all you've got. So if you've realized the file you deleted was further back, you can't go back there. The other issue with snapshots is snapshots have to be kept chronologically. So if you delete some snapshots in the middle, or a snapshot in the middle is accidentally lost, you can't go back to the ones before it. They have to be kept in order and you have to maintain them all. You can't go back from October 1st back to August without September, or without one specific day. You can't jump them. So you have to keep that whole record of snapshots because they are based on the blueprints that came before them. So again, snapshots are very, very desirable and much like RAID, much like USB backups, much like snapshot, I'm oh, sorry, uh, cloud backups and NAS to server backups, they have a place in your backup strategy and there are lots of ways to back up and I recommend you use all of these. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I know it kind of spiraled off, but there's so many things to cover and only a finite amount of time. Thank you so much for watching. Click like if you've enjoyed the video and subscribe to learn more. If you can think of other methods that I've not highlighted that you think are relevant in 2021, let me know in the comments. There's links in the description to all the things I've talked about today and the best data working practices that I recommend you follow. I'll see you next time.